that better? Are you all able to see it now? Yes, we can see that. Okay, perfect. Okay, is there any way that I can, um, yeah, there we go. Some of the pop-ups are coming down into the part of my screen where I can't see it all, but okay. So um, this agenda is based on what you all have asked um, for me to talk about today. So of course, you all know the audience was polled for questions and then I've developed a presentation based on those. And I put it put everything into categories. So it'll be practice life, student life, and social life. And of course, um, a QA at the end. Anything goes, ask your question. Um, if you all were here last time, you know that I'm gonna keep it real. I'm gonna tell you just like it is. All right. So um, this is just an overview of Cetris and Gynecology. Of course, this is a practitioner of young ladies and women and um, obstetric side. Of course, you do prenatal counseling, um, care during pregnancies, which is like the antepartum period. Of course, delivery, which is that special moment. And then postpartum care. Then as far as the gynecology component is, of course, we do like our wellness visits, which is like your annual exam, where some people say, I'm here for a checkup, or I'm here for an annual, or I'm here for a pap smear. All that means is an annual, it's all the same. So we do our annuals, our clinical breast examinations, mammograms, of course, age appropriate screenings, including sexually transmitted infection testing. We talk about nutrition, exercise, we screen for depression, um, depression and intimate partner violence. So like basically, you're you're not coming for just a pap smear and not to be talked to, or you're not coming for just a breast exam to get your mammogram scheduled. Our goal at this visit, especially since a lot of times a gynecologist is going to be the only person that um, a lady will see for the entire year, you want to make sure that you are basically assessing the person's well-being. Of course, contraception management, menstrual cycle management, um, sexual health management, all of that. And so um, here was one of the questions, what are the different subspecialties of OB and GYN? So from the obstetric side, maternal fetal medicine is the only one. Of course, they care for women who are high risk themselves or um, pregnancies that have fetuses that are high risk. So like fetal anomalies and things like that. We are currently getting ready to do a C-section on someone who um, has um, a fetal anomaly. And so, and actually the C-section is for that particular reason. So sometimes um, the mode of delivery even changes depending on um, the baby status. This is a three-year fellowship and we actually do have a fellowship here at our university, University of Mississippi Medical Center. From the gynecolo um, gynecologic side, pediatric gynecology, so we care for young girls in general, menstrual cycle control and hygiene. So when I say menstrual cycle hygiene, that's a little different. So what that means is say for instance, there is a person that has developmental delay or um, they have some type of physical um, issue where they're unable to um, do proper toilet toileting and things like that, well, we may actually put them on some type of hormones to stop their periods. So that's what menstrual cycle hygiene means. Uterine anomalies like uterine didelphus, bicornear uterus, vaginal agenesis, and this is a two-year fellowship. Minimally invasive surgery, um, this is more training. So like, of course, I'm a general OBGYN and I have training in um, laparoscopic procedures, hysteroscopic procedures, um, treating endometriosis, fibroids and things like that. But this person takes two more years to actually hone in on their straight stick and robot skills and hysteroscopic skills. So what's a hysteroscopy? <laughs> that is when you use a camera to go through the vagina into the uterus and then you can take a look at the um, cavity of the uterus. From that point, you can like remove fibroids or polyps, which are both benign growths, or you can get endometrial sampling. So say for instance, you weren't able to get like a sample in the operating or in the clinic, you can take the person to the operating room to get that sample. Um, and of course, like I said, endometriosis and um, fibroids. And um, that is a two year fellowship. Urogynecology, so this is a pelvic floor specialist. They deal with um, pelvic organ prolapse, which means dropped bladder, dropped rectum, dropped uterus. I have seen a uterus literally come all the way out 
of the vagina. And you can only imagine that I was like, ah, when I first saw it the first time. I mean, because I just didn't know what to expect. Like, what is this protruding out towards me? But it actually is a real issue. And it's something that, you know, our urogynecologists see every day, they deal with every day, and there are lots of different types of management. And then, of course, they also deal with the lower urinary system. So stress incontinence, meaning laugh, cough, sneeze, urge incontinence, meaning it's like, as soon as you feel the urge to go to the restroom, it's like, I better get there, or I may have some bladder leakage. Overactive bladder going to the restroom every 15, 30, 45 minutes. Um, they deal with those things. Of course, I deal with urge incontinence, overactive bladder, and things like that. Of course, um, we deal as generalists with a lot of these things, but you have extra training, and so sometimes you'll go see the subspecialist, and that's a four-year fellowship. They do lots and lots of um, extra surgery for those um, issues. And then gynecologic oncology. So this person manages cancers of the female reproductive tract. Um, so of course they have lots and lots more experience in surgeries, chemotherapy, and surveillance of um, cancers. Um, and this person would also learn more about performing surgeries on like the bowel and things like that, um, doing appendectomies and uh, removing parts of the colon and the small intestines. And so um, our um, GYN oncology people here, they are outstanding. They are sometimes the people that will call when we get into like some deep mess in the OR. We're like, call Dr. Ridgeway or whoever is on and, you know, they'll come in and save our butts. So they're like really, really outstanding surgeons. Reproductive endocrinology. So that's the fertility specialist. Um, um, they do things like intrauterine insemination, in vitro fertilization. Um, they talk to people. Sometimes they'll do, they do lots of ultrasounds and they also perform surgeries to remove polyps and myomectomy um, or fibroids, that's a myomectomy. And basically their goal is to help someone get pregnant. So whatever issue they're having, their goal is to fix it and help them get pregnant. Um, and just to make mention, I actually had IUI or intrauterine insemination um, to get pregnant with my almost two year old. And so um, I did use a fertility specialist. And then they also deal with um, female reproductive tract anomalies um, and hormone imbalances. Practice life, here's another question. So I went, um, I kind of went a little bit out of order, but um, is it possible to practice exclusively just obstetrics or gynecology? Absolutely. Come in. Sorry, Hey. Now. Okay. They have been moving. Oh, what am I looking? This one's trying to look. Yeah. They have been moving so damn slow around here today. Say hi. Oh, excuse my language. <laughs> <laughs> I <don't> know. <laughs> I'm doing a presentation for some students. Oh. <laughs> this is this is one of our chief residents. Uh, she's gonna say hi to y'all. <laughs> I apologize for my language. That is not how I talk on the record. <laughs> Okay. But I am hopeful that we'll get moving on her shortly. Okay. Well, I just saw that her labs aren't back just yet. And so I don't know if we're waiting. Do y'all think she's changing? She's banging out those contractions. Yeah. So she was banging them out every minute or two downstairs. She was four there. We checked her since she's been up here and she hadn't changed. But I told him that my concern is I don't want for her baby to get too far into her pelvis. That's <laughs> going to be a mess. A mess. Make sure we have a vaginal hand ready because. I mean, it's gonna be and what kind of incision are you gonna do on her uterus? Oh, that's a very good question. What are you gonna do? Uh, God, God, God. I already I know what I want to do, but you tell me what you're gonna I do. I didn't even think about it. Honestly, if I'm thinking about <laughs> space and size, she probably gonna need a classical. Exactly. Because mm -hmm. the baby's head is too large to come mm -hmm. out of a, 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 a LST. Yeah. Not okay. without it ripping up to her uterus. Golf would be. I know, Lord, let it be okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be fine. Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I told anesthesia that I really wanted to roll like yesterday. Okay, sounds good. Y'all just let me know. All right. So um you all can build your practice to care for a certain population of people. 
Um, and sometimes this may be just a tad bit difficult under certain circumstances, like say you're in a private practice, like under those um, circumstances, you'll probably just need to be able to get whoever you have and whoever you can. Um, but there are opportunities for you to become a laborist or a hospitalist. Um, of course, that person would mainly do obstetrics and some emergent um, surgeries like ectopic pregnancies or DNCs and things like that. Here and there, they'll get caught with like a hysterectomy, like somebody that needs an, an emergent type of surgery or uh, ovarian torsion, which is basically the ovary gets a little larger and then it twists on itself and it causes like excruciating pain. And your goal when the person, once it's diagnosed, your goal is to get that person to the operating room as soon as possible and detour it so that the person doesn't lose their ovary. And so anyways, um, that is definitely a way you can always subspecialize. And I'll just mention that sometimes towards the beginning of someone's career, they're going to have more obstetric patients. And then towards as they kind of age, the patients age with them. And then their practice turns more into gynecology. I do have a senior partner right now that works with me. He, um, does, he no longer does obstetrics and um, he actually was out for a couple of months with COVID. And when he came back, he said, Jolene, I'm not operating anymore. You got all them surgeries, I'm done. And so he's now just a, a generalist, a gynecologist that takes care of patients in the clinic only. And he'll see some of our OB patients and things like that. He still has full privileges. It's just that he, for his own patients, he's not gonna do it. And so just mentioned that. Um, how do you manage dealing with unexpected complications? Well, so you'll learn that you have to stay prepared. Um, when you've had really good training, which of course, wherever you go for your residency, you're gonna have great training. Um, you'll learn to keep your eyes open for, um, and of course, anticipate things that could possibly go wrong. Like for instance, we've got all these patients on this board right now. I don't know if y'all can see that board over there with um, all the lines on them on the wall. Um, I keep my eyes on that. There are some people that are in labor right now and I'm always ready for an emergency C-section. Or there are some people on that board that have very, very high blood pressures. Well, I'm always ready for this person to have a C-section. I already know my management. I already know like what I'm gonna call for and things like that. So if you have good training, you know at the back of your mind what to be expecting um, or what to look for in abnormalities. Now, of course, even with that, there's still some things that are unexpected. Like for instance, um, I recently had one of my patients that had um, a fetal demise. We actually had here at the hospital, I would say in the past two weeks, maybe four or five patients that had fetal demises. And of course, um, preeclampsia in a very healthy patient or postpartum hemorrhage, those are things to be like looking out for in your deliveries or death of a mother. We haven't had one of those, um, um, well, we have actually, um, she had COVID, I believe. Um, but my second year of residency, we actually had um, a couple of deaths in the same like two week period. So those things are totally unexpected and how you deal with them, um, you know, it's a mental thing. Um, it's a support thing. And I'm gonna get to that in just a second. Of course, when you are dealing with your management, I kind of already talked about this. You wanna act quickly and then make sure that you're not leaving the patient or the person in the room with them out. Like you can't just walk into a room and say you're gonna do something because there's an emergent situation. Sometimes patients don't recognize emergency the way that we as physicians do. So making sure that you communicate with them in a way where you're calm, but you're letting them know that it is, uh, it's urgent that you do X, Y, Z. And then making sure you provide that support for them and answering, giving them time to ask the questions. Now, of course, if there is a baby that um, is showing us what we call terminal bradycardia, um, meaning the heart rate is down, we can't get the baby back up, and it is a life-saving measure to have a C-section in the next two minutes, those are situations where we don't have a lot of time to communicate with my mom. So what we do is we tell them, mom, your baby's heart rate is down. We are very concerned. We have to perform an emergency C-section to help save you and your baby's life. Things are gonna go very, very fast, but just know that everybody knows exactly what they're doing and we do this very often. So you are gonna be safe. 
That's what we tell our patients. And we just hope that they like are on board. We have had some people that were like, no, you're not gonna do a C-section on me. And other people are like, just do what you gotta do, save my baby. And so those are the things that um, I would answer with that. Question four, what is um, your thought process when you have um, a, um, a routine or an emergency C-section or delivery? So of course, when you're deciding, and I kind of mentioned this a second ago, but if you're deciding if someone needs an emergency C-section, you have to consider the following. So like a cervical exam. So if the person is complete, you can just tell them, go ahead, go ahead and push this baby out. Or you can tell them, you know what, your baby's in um, distress right now. So if you're okay with it, I would like to help you um, um, deliver your baby. And you can use like a vacuum or forceps. Um, if the baby is in distress, um, or if the mom is in distress, we've definitely had situations where the mom has coded and she's getting chest compressions and we have to do a bedside cesarean delivery. Those are the worst. Um, I um, actually, <laughs> I missed out on one one time. I was actually supposed to be on that night and something, I don't know what it was, but I didn't come in that night. And one of my classmates came in for me and I was like, thank God I didn't have to do it but they do happen um, and it's not like an uncommon thing. And then another thing that you have to think about is what would be the outcome if you did not deliver quickly? Could it result in the death of the baby or could it, and, and, and not even death, but could it result in cerebral palsy? Could it result in some type of other neurological deficit? Um, could it result in death of the mother, a seizure in the mother? And that's coming from the standpoint of preeclampsia or like uterine rupture, meaning the um, uterus opens up with the baby still on the inside. Would it result in um, a severe hemorrhage and blood loss that would cause the mom or the baby to pass? So you have to be thinking about those things. We keep those things in mind. Um, decision is made, of course, quickly in the matter of like three to five minutes. Um, we like we talk about this, you communicate with the patient, you communicate with your nursing staff, and then we do have what we call a stat um, page that we use. So for instance, say I went into a room of this patient and I noticed that the baby's heart rate was down, we did everything that we could, I would communicate with the nurse, they would use the stat pager um, number and it goes off to the NICU staff, the me, the attending, goes off to the chief resident, goes off for the anesthesia people and the charge nurse, pretty much <laughs> like everyone that would be involved. So say for instance, I had a stat C-section, I mean an emergency C-section from our women's urgent care, which is like on our ground level of this hospital. I'm on the second floor right now. I would get the page and I would see on my pager where it says 000911. All I would do is run to the operating room. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know who it is. All I know is I need to meet my team in the operating room and that's where everybody else is gonna go as well. And we just meet the patient there, wherever she's coming from. Um, and then the baby, from the time that we do our skin incision to the time that baby is delivered, it should be within 30 to 60 seconds. So as you can imagine, it's a very, very fast procedure. Next question, are there any misconceptions about being an OBGYN or physician in general um, that we hear often? So of course, um, <laughs> I would say, well, of course there's lots of misconceptions, but this is one of the things that just like immediately popped into mind. Doctors make a lot of money. Well, I would say yes, doctors do make a lot of money as it relates to the national average of just income. However, you have to keep in mind that there's a lot of debt involved. Like you all are going through a lot right now. All the undergraduate and then medical school and then like residency, all the debt that you incur, like it comes to sometimes more than what you make in a year. And so, um, and, and you still got to live and you know what I mean? So yes, and uh, you have you have a lot of risk associated with, you know, your livelihood. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that I normally see. And then what they don't realize is that when you're a resident physician, people think that as soon as you get out of medical school, your name is Dr. Wynn, or your name is Dr. Kane, or Dr. Hamilton, I see you all, um, that you make a lot of money. I actually had a classmate that I hadn't talked to in a very long time. 
we were friends on Facebook, but probably since middle school or maybe high school that I hadn't spoken to her. And I was in residency and she asked me for some money out of nowhere. And out of the kindness of my heart, I was thinking, you know, I actually, <laughs> what, so what's going on with you, girl? Hey, girl, had nice to, you know, you know, it wasn't even like a, let me catch up with you first. It was like, I need some money. And it kind of took me for a loop because I'm thinking I'm actually just in residency and I'm not making a lot of money and I have a lot of bills and I was like, I'm going to give her what she asked for because I want to help her. But it really hurt my feelings a little bit because I'm like, you've not even spoken to me in all these years. And because my name is Dr. Sims, you assume that I make a lot of money when I make probably less than minimum wage or minimum wage. So we may make 40, $50, uh, I mean, 50, 40 to 50,000 a year as a resident. But when you think about the number of hours that we work, it comes down to like hardly nothing. So anyways, that's one of the things that I just wanted to like throw out there, you know, things that you'll face, you know, people will kind of talk to you like you make all this money and things like that. And they don't understand what comes behind it. Um, some people say, well, she's smart, but she has limited bedside manners. Of course, that's true for some people, but um, um, it's not true for all. Males can't or don't become OBGYNs any longer. I mean, of course, it used to be a male-dominated field, but it is no longer a male-dominated field. But we still do have lots of men that go into OBGYN. Um, I'm trying to think. Can y'all can, can y'all think of any that... Anyone else? Let me see, where's this chat screen? So there were um, a couple of questions about like malpractice insurance. And there's, a, we don't know if it's a misconception that OB, OB GYNs have some of the highest rates of lawsuits filed against them. Is that true? Can you speak on that a little bit? So I don't know the, the full statistics. However, I do know that when it relates to birth injuries and things like that, Yes, um, even malpractice insurance is a little bit even more expensive for an OBGYN um, compared to like, for instance, you know, internal medicine or family medicine. Neurosurgery, their insurance is very high too. Um, I think out of neurosurgery and obstetrics, they're probably the highest um, from what I can remember. But yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Um, and then a lot of things that y'all have to think about too is like, the risk level is extremely high for anyone that's an OBGYN. The stress level, I mean, I mean, for, for anyone that's a physician, that's a practicing physician, um, uh, all of that stuff kind of goes into, I mean, you get, you're getting calls on the weekends when you're off. Like I had a call, I give my patients um, a phone number that they can call me on. Um, and some of them call me for silly things over the weekend, but you know, you get calls for patient from patients over the weekend and you're never off. Like it's like you're off, but you're not off. Off. And so you got to kind of take that all into consideration when you're talking about the, uh, the um, how much you make as a physician. Um, but yeah, as far as that malpractice insurance and malpractice suits, yeah. I mean, I've only been out for a year and a half, um, a little over a year and a half, and I already have a malpractice suit. Now it's bogus. It's a GYN case. I mean, it's very, very bogus. Like they were like, what? <laughs> and then like, what they what they're suing me for is like not even what happened so i'm like okay they probably didn't even request records so um it's not gonna go anywhere but the point is i'm still in the middle of a lawsuit like it's crazy um so yeah they happen um are there more questions another, yeah there was another misconception um and i don't know if you'll touch on this later in your presentation but people were saying like is it true that um, OBGYNs don't have like a personal life. Are you always on call? I mean, birth happens all the time, whenever. Um, how do you like, how does your, how do your weekends look like? How does your call schedule look like? So, um, I'm in a little bit of a different situation than probably a lot of people when they come out. I'm actually not in a call pool. I'm on call tonight because I wanted to be on call tonight. So I, I suck out this call so that I could do this presentation for you all. 
But I don't have to, I'm net, like I'm not in their call pool. I say, would I want to take a poll so that I can like do something like this or do some work for my foundation? Then I find a day that I can go in and I pick the day that I want. Um, but as it relates to my patient, I'm on call for them 24 seven. Now, do I go every single time? No. I try for the patients that I know for a fact want me there. I say, well, you need to let me induce you so that I can make sure I'm in the hospital or around the hospital. But if you go into labor outside of that, I'll try my best to be there. So I probably would say probably 90 to 95% of my patients, I've been to their deliveries. Some of them I'm driving down the street and they deliver and I say, oh, go back at home <laughs> in the middle of the night um, because I don't make it there in time. But I try my best to be there. Um, so yeah, it, it, you're right. It can be a 24 seven thing, but it doesn't have to be. I have some, um, some partners here that say, when I'm on, I'm on, I'm off, I'm off. Don't call me about nothing. You can send me a message and let me know my patient's in and okay, that sounds great. I'll make sure they have a follow-up visit. Um, so some people, you know, they, they, they set those boundaries. For me, I'm kind of early in practice and, you know, I, I realized that if I've taken care of a patient throughout their entire delivery or, or pregnancy that, you know, it's special for them and it's also special for me to be there for them at that moment. And so that's why I try to get in for my patients. But if I can't, I just tell them, you know, I'm sorry. I, I call them in the rooms while they're in the hospital. Um, I actually, one of my patients that's on this board right now, I knew I was coming tonight. I, um, she actually got delivered earlier today unexpectedly. And I was like, I'm at the park with my baby. Let her know that I know she's delivering and I'll come see her on the suite a little later. So, um, yeah. But, and I will touch on that in just a second. Um, I think that's it for like um, misconceptions. So you can go. Okay. On. Thank you. Um, some more myths. Um, you can't be on. Oh, this is just related to like GYN stuff because a lot of people talk about this. Um, you, you can't be on your cycle to have a GYN visit. Myth, go ahead and go. Um, and unless you're just like completely uncomfortable. Pap smears versus pelvic exams. Well, a pap smear is actually a lab. It's actually um, a pelvic exam that we actually use a brush on the cervix to send to the path lab to see if there are precancerous cells. A pelvic exam can be a, bi a bimanual exam, which means that there's one hand that, go um, that inserts into the vagina and one hand that is on the um, abdomen. And you use that to just to palpate the uterus in the cervix. Um, or you can have a speculum exam, which means that you use the same speculum that you would use to get a pap smear, but you're just looking. Um, or you may get like an STD swab or something like that. Um, you only need GYN care during reproductive years. No, actually you need it, you know, forever and ever and ever for the most part because you still need mammograms, you still need clinical breast exams and um, sometimes people want to assess like, you know, intimate partner violence or um, do STD testing and things like that. Um, and you even need pap smears all the way up to age 65, mammograms up to 75 um, uh, under certain circumstances. Um, birth control makes you fat. No, 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 not all of it. There are some that have an increased risk for uh, weight gain. Pap smears um, start when you start having sex um, and are every year. Well, no, you start pap smears at age 21 and they're not every year unless they're abnormal. So those are a couple of other myth busters that I just figured I'd share. Student life, woohoo, moving on. How do you differentiate the feeling that medical school is not the right fit versus imposter syndrome or self-doubt? Let me tell y'all something. What God has for you is for you. So if you know in your heart that God has designed you to be a physician, you can forget all the imposter syndrome, all the self-doubt, because he's already designed and paved the way for you to become a physician. So just, you know, pray your way through, you know, you may need to like find yourself a massage somewhere. You might need to like go get you some ice cream and or whatever it is to like get that stress and all those bad feelings out of your mind so that you can like get back to the focus of what you are, were designed to do. Um, so if you, or if you truly believe in your heart that the path that you're currently on in medical school is not right for you, I'd say, you know what? Go to the other side. But my goal, um, my goal for you all is to just, you know, do a self-assessment. Take a moment and look at your progress. Celebrate your victories. 
empower and motivate yourself. And just remember that you are not your failed attempts. Like I told y'all last time, I did not get into medical school two times before I finally like did something different to like get into medical school. And I am not my failed attempts. I am not my, um, you know, bad MCAT scores. Um, I think sometimes, <laughs> I can't remember I think last time when I told everybody that my first MCAT score was an 11 and the second one was an eight, they were able to like translate it to the new scores, but just let me tell you, they're poor, 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 crazy poor. So just know that, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you have to just kind of do a self-assessment and do, be doing some praying and things like that because, you know, the enemy is always on attack and people around you sometimes just remember your friends sometimes are really not your friends because sometimes you may get that self-doubt in your mind because you're around people that are doubting you so be careful the company you keep make sure you have company that are like going to go to bat for you no matter what they're going to be the ones that are going to push you and motivate you that's what you need around you when you are going through really tough time in undergrad, in medical school, in residency. You only need people that are going to be positive, people that are going to tell you the truth. And so that's that's where I that's where I come from on that. And of course, I like after I like failed my MCAT and failed getting into medical school two times, and um, I was kind of like at a crossroads, like okay, so what am I going to do next? And people were like, hey, so what's next? And I'm sitting here like I don't I, I don't know. And they're like, so are you going to be a doctor? I just told them I'm going to be a doctor. They're like, well, how are you going to get there? I don't know yet. That was my truth. That was my truth. But please believe I worked on it and I got there. So I don't want, you know, your self-doubt or your, you know, procrastination or your imposter syndrome to get you to the point where you move into a different field and you're out of the, the destiny that has been set for you before you were even thought of by your parents. Um, and then, like I said, if you can honestly say that you'd be ha more happy in another field, you know, figure out what it is, come up with a plan and switch over. And then you use the, you know, use the skills that you developed in this field to like edify where you're going. What can we do as pre-med students to get more experience in the clinical setting? So, of course, pre-pandemic and post-pandemic or during the pandemic are two different things. Um, um, pre-pandemic, of course, I would say call a local practice and ask to shadow, work as a clinical scribe, which is a person that basically will work with a physician and type out the note or write out the note um, of for what's going on in the, um, the clinical visit. So it will help that person with their documentation. Um, work in a science lab or a research lab, volunteer at the um, local free clinic or with health fairs. And I would recommend um, when you're like putting together your resume and you're trying to think of meaningful experiences, um, try not to like just do like one thing here, one thing there, one thing here, one thing here, and just be all splattering because then you have like a bunch of like things on your resume, but it looks like there's no longevity in it. So what I recommend doing is getting with like an organization, getting with a group and doing multiple things with that group. So then when you put it on your resume, it says, well, I worked for um, the Student Medical Association or whatever, um, the Student Medical Association. And through that organization or like underneath the, the title, you put this organization stands for blah, 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 just like in maybe two sentences. And then you can like bullet point all the different things you did with them with them and you'll have like oh well I did this from 2017 to 2019 and so it looks like you had a very very rich experience under this particular umbrella and so um that would be what I would say to get more um experience because of course you know when you're working with like a student organization y'all gonna go and do like health fairs y'all gonna go and um you know try to take blood pressures you're gonna try to you know, whatever it is that you do, you're going to go and talk to, you know, children about, you know, healthy eating and healthy dieting and things like that. And if you're a part of an organization that doesn't really do um, outreach like that, 
you can actually reach out, like come amongst yourselves and say, hey, we want to do a little bit more recent uh, outreach in schools or this or that. And what you'll do is say, okay, well, why don't we partner with an elementary school or partner with this particular church, um, partner with this community organization, and we'll host different activities for uh, and try to get through all of their classes well that right there brings you lots of experience so just be creative in the activities that you do of course post pandemic all the above but of course sometimes those experiences may be a little bit scarce things are starting to open back up um and so you just kind of have to you know ask different people you know don't stop at just one no Get you 15 no's before you get your yes. It don't matter. Like, keep on pushing because you know what, you're, what you need to do. You know what you have as your, like, ultimate goal. Um, and then, of course, you can still join a research project. I will tell you this. If you are at um, a, a university, like a school right now, and there are some professors that are doing research projects, let me tell you, they are busy. They are so busy that if you decide that you want to join their project, they would love to see you there because they need someone to help write for them. They need someone to help like collect data for them. And they'll put you on as a person where you'll be like, well, now I'm published. And so they actually need extra help to get their work done because they still have their you know, their family life, they still have their work life, they still have their research life, they still have papers to grade and all kinds of things. Sometimes people even um, run out of time to finish their projects where they have to put them to the side. But if you come in and help them out, you get lots of good experience. Um, and then <clears throat> Another thing I mentioned is, you know, be creative, look for opportunities in COVID vaccine clinics or testing sites. And I know that sometimes that may be a little bit, you know, scary, you know, if you're unvaccinated. Um, but, you know, where in 95, where the protection that they have and you can, you know, hop right in there and do some help. Because I know for a fact right now that some of these vaccine clinics do not have enough personnel to make sure that they can like keep up with all the vaccines that are being um, administered. So. Those are my suggestions. How did you balance a healthy relationship in medicine during residency? Well, let me just tell you, I didn't. I don't think I was very good at it. Um, and the reason why I say that is because when you're working 80, 90 hours a week, it's really difficult to like do anything great except for your work. That's just the honest to God truth. Like. When you have that much work going on and while you're there, you're running, 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 like you're not sitting down all the time, you're going to come home and you're going to crash. Like, and that takes away time from the, the relationship that you want to make sure that you can cherish. So basically what I did here was I put together some things that I did and things that, you know, you can do to help maintain your relationships. So... Remember important dates. Do something special, like, for instance, birthdays, anniversaries, and things like that. Or, you know, not, not just, like, relationship anniversaries, but, like, work anniversaries. So, like, um, this year, my husband celebrated his 20th year on his job. I actually went to this website online that um, called Successories, um, and I bought him a pin that had 20 years of service, and it had his name on it, and he wears that on his suit coat now. And so that was just like a little trinket that he really, really liked. Do just because gestures, like, you know, send a card, send the flowers. Um, remember to tell the person how much you appreciate them. Like, sometimes we get so full of work and life and all the things that we have to do that we forget to mention to the people that we love that we actually love them. And we forget to tell them how much we appreciate them supporting us. And I can tell you that it definitely means a lot. Like it means so much to have someone tell you when you're busting your butt for them to like make sure that they can succeed, that they appreciate you. So that's another thing. Of course, um, take vacations. And when you go on these vacations, put that phone away. Like when you go to a restaurant and you look around, you'll see people at the same table on their phone texting someone who is not even with them. 
So my thought is just be in the moment. Like when you go and you're supposed to be with like your friend or your significant other, be in the moment with them at that time and make the time count. Um, send a text, um, make a call throughout the day. Like you um, as a resident or even as a medical student, you're gonna be studying long, long hours and you're gonna be away from the home for long periods of time. And if you just send a text message to say, hey, I'm thinking about you, I love you. Hey, I'm, I'm, um, I'm on my way home. Or, you know, just keeping the person up to date and letting them know that you're okay, letting them know that you're still alive. Um, my husband used to get on me about that all the time um, because I knew what type of test taker I was. So when I was studying for my step one, I studied from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And I'll just mention that my husband and I were actually living nine hours apart. So when I studied from my 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., I really probably shouldn't have turned my phone off. I actually had my phone off and I was like going hard for my study because I said, I don't want to study late. I'm not a night owl like that to be studying up like that. I need to be during the time where I know my brain has the maximum capacity to like take in information and do my work. And I was turning off my phone during that time and I did have an iPad. So my still text messages would pop up there and I would just quickly like shoot something back. But for the most part, I wasn't taking calls and I wasn't taking text messages. And um, when the six o'clock time hit, then I was free to like do whatever I wanted to do, you know, my self care, talk on the phone, but he didn't like that. And I probably shouldn't have did that. <laughs> I probably should have, you know, done this little thing right here. And then, and so now I do like send a text throughout the day and say, hey, I love you, that thing, but you know, or whatever. So those would be just my um, suggestions. What is your work life balance? How often are you on call? We kind of chatted about this. Um, I guess um, <laughs> the better question is from my standpoint to distinguish um, <laughs> between um, what I am and not required to do. Um, and that's why I, when I explain to you all um, that I'm not in a call pool um, and you know I'm not required to take a call, I, that's why I mentioned that right there. So what I'm required to do is four days of clinic. So I'm in clinic on Monday, Tuesday, uh, to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And on Thursdays, that's my OR day or my hospital day. So for the most part, I will schedule my C-sections on Thursdays, all of my GYN surgeries on Thursdays. I'll schedule my inductions of labor um, for the most part on Wednesday for delivery on Thursday. So like I'll have them labor throughout the day or night on Wednesday. And then on Thursday when I'm in the hospital, a lot of times, you know, I'm, I'm available for their deliveries. Um, now, what do I do? Like I said, I'm present for um, over 90% of my patients' deliveries. I take call when I want. Sometimes I'll take one, sometimes I'll take two, 12 hour shifts per, one, for, um, per month and I'll only take a night call. Now, um, last weekend, someone called me at the last minute and was like, hey, I need help with this call. Would you mind just taking half of my call? It was just a 12 hour shift, so I just took six hours. And I was fine with that. It was during the day. Um, my baby is now starting to get used to like saying bye-bye to mommy when, you know, when we leave the house and things like that. And she knows, you know, we always tell her, she says, be back. So she knows that when I leave the house, I'm always gonna come home. So she's fine with that, but two extended periods of time, she's not having it. So that's where I draw the line. I will not take a 24 hour call, which these are 24 hour calls. I just tell them I'll take half of your call. Um, and then work-life balance. Sometimes it's actually pretty good. Like today, I would say it was a very, very nice day. We got up early, fed Zoe, and we actually went to the park. And then after the park for a couple of hours, we actually went to a place where we could sit outside and eat. And Zoe had a ball and fell asleep on the way home. And that was like a really, really nice time for us to just have some family time outside, beautiful weather. And other times I'll say it needs work. Your life as a physician is never gonna be the same from week to week or month to month. There are gonna be times that you're a lot more busy in clinic or have a lot more patients in the hospital. And there are gonna be times where things are a little bit more scarce and you have a lot more family time. And so it is gonna be very important that you all find someone who understands you as a professional person. Like 
understands and appreciates the fact that sometimes they may not be number one, or sometimes you may have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the hospital and they have to be okay with that. If, if you have, if you're in a relationship where it's the, the person is not supportive or the person is like, I don't want you leaving this house, um, you know, when we're together and hanging out or they have a problem with it, you're going to have a very, very difficult relationship and you're going to have a very, very difficult career. And so that is my advice to you. Just make sure when you are like, you know, diddling and dab and in and out of these relationships that you are kind of, you know, <laughs> assessing for that to be um, a successful component of your relationship or if you think it's going to be difficult, I would say move on. Move on. You don't want to, you don't, you, you don't want to, get into a relationship and then get into residency and have a divorce. And so that's just, I'm just being honest. <laughs> what is residency life like a, um, a in, in OBGYN? Okay, so it's a four-year residency. And then of course, we talked about the subspecialties. Intern year, and this is just at our residency program. Um, at intern year, you become basically an expert <laughs> in doing circumcisions. Um, in some programs, the PEDS team does the circumcisions, but our program, the OB team does the circumcisions, especially for the newborns. Um, sometimes um, the PEDS team will do some for some of the other babies, but we do most of them. Okay. Um, and then, um, of course, the obstetric side. You get really good at that. Um, you, your second most um, common procedure that you're going to do is going to be um, a C-section. And our interns at our program, you do C-sections the first day. If you're on la labor and delivery and you got a C-section that day, you're about to do it. Um, you, you, you don't have a waiting period. Your waiting period was a uh, medical school. <laughs> and so um, you just get thrown right in deep in and you better survive. <laughs> um, we won't let you drown though. And then second year, you um, do a lot more, lots more OB, and then you become familiar, um, more familiar with like GYN. Of course, intern year, you do get some GYN experience um, on some of like the minor cases. You get to do some of the um, the major cases, but you're not going to be like the main, you know, surgeon for the major cases. And then you'll do some subspecialties as well um, during your second year, um, like REI and GYN oncology and um, urogynecology. And then third year, you get really good at GYN. And at our program, we actually go um, to two different parts of Mississippi, Tupelo, which is up in North Mississippi, and then Hattiesburg, which is like 45 minutes or so, an hour maybe from here. Um, and you do, all you do is operate all day long, five days a week. I mean, you get really, really, really good. With your surgical procedures and you do a lot more subspecialty work get um very good with like managing high-risk patients um as it relates to like the obstetric side chief year you should be to the point where you're fine-tuning your skills like you manage all of the patients on the floor so like the resident that just came in here a second ago she's actually just getting back from maternity leave but she's one of the chief residents and so right now there are four patients in the hospital they're i mean sorry patients Lord, it'd be nice if there was four patients. Now, there are four residents in the hospital, a one, a two, a three, and a four. And um, the one and three, they work together. They're downstairs in our women's urgent care. And uh, and I'll show y'all. There are, oh, looks like somebody's about to come up here for labor. Look at her, woo woo. Um, but as y'all can see, this is like um, a pretty, it's a busy, busy night right now in women's urgent care. And it's probably gonna be like that all night long. Um, and then our labor and delivery um, floors have our second and fourth year. And basically the chief resident is in charge of everything, but the third year is also in charge of everything that goes on in women's urgent care. Um, and if, if, if that person needs help, they'll go to the chief um, before they come to me for something. And so um, lots of surgeries, lots of deliveries, early mornings, late nights, lots of victories and lots of mistakes. This is where you want your mistakes to happen in residency because you don't want to have like a serious mistake as an attending because guess what? The buck stops with you. When you have, um, when you're a resident, you still have an attending or someone that you can go to to help correct your mistake or oversee you. But if you make your mistake as an attending, I'm not saying that you never make mistakes like we all do. I'm just saying like, this is the part where you make your learning mistakes. 
And then, of course, good times always outweigh the bad. A lot of people say, um, I have a hand raised. Um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, I have a lot of people that say, oh, OBGYN residents, they always look tired. They always look mad. Well, no, we're not always tired and mad, but we do work a lot of hours and we do have a lot of very, very high risk patients and we do have a lot of very sad things that happen sometimes. And so, um, yeah, we, we do get a little bit, you know, sad about the situations or burned out and things like that. What's your question, Dr. Shakib? I'm sorry, I'm not for sure if I pronounced uh, your name right, but please tell me um, how to pronounce it. They might, they might have accidentally raised their hand or something. Oh, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. so we'll get, if they have a question later on, we'll get to it. Perfect. So um, what, is res what do residents do during their call? I'm actually gonna... Um, call in from my phone and take y'all around. They should be calling me soon for some people down in women's urgent care anyway. So we're gonna go down there so y'all can see them. But in the meantime, what questions do y'all have? Anything? This is just um, some information. I'm on um, Facebook, on Instagram. That's my email. Let me tell y'all something. When someone comes to speak to you all and says, feel free to reach out. They actually mean it. Please reach out if you have questions. Please like, you know, if you, um, stop sharing, there we go. So I can see the chat box. If you all like have a question and you're not for sure, like what you should do about something, feel free to reach out to the people that have, you know, opened their, you know, the line of communication for you. Um, because if you don't reach out and you, you never know what, like, you know, opportunity you may have missed out on. Um, I see a question right here. I'm very inter interested in OBGYN. However, I was put off by the history of Dr. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. But let me tell you, be the change. That's what I'm currently working on. I am the diversity, equity, inclusion officer for our residency program. Um, in our department, uh, one of the officers for our department, and we are working to come against all the systemic racism that, you know, was developed for years and years and years. You don't have to be the one that, you know, perpetrates those same things and continues on that cycle. Your goal is to be the one that those patients can come to because they know that you're not going to be racist. They know that you're going to take it care of them. They know that you're going to listen to them. So don't allow the past to predict what you're gonna do moving forward. I frequently question the potential ethical issues that arise from practicing a specialty that exists because of racial violence. Have you ever faced the same conflict? Nope, because I know that I don't do that to patients. My patients love me and they know that I'm listening to them. That I just told y'all they have my cell phone number. Like, I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna let the past predict what is gonna be my destiny. I know that God has me here to take care of women and to make sure that I properly may, uh, manage their lives and manage their babies. I know that, um, you know, if I need to ask out, ask for help, like I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to make sure this patient remains alive and well in my care. Um, how do you reconcile all this? Just basically kind of said, um, how do I practice anti-oppression? Basically, I, I mean, I, I do things, um, or was it yesterday, Thursday night, I actually did um, a session on Black maternal health. Basically, your goal is to raise awareness to the things of the past and how you're moving forward. Like, if we basically dwelled on things that were of the past, I mean, we had Black people that weren't able to vote, had Black people that were whipped. We're not, you know, I mean, there, there are so many other things that go beyond the Dr. James, Mary, and Sims and the um, the treatment that he um, did to black slaves to develop this pelvic floor surgeries and things like that and, you know, putting them back in the fields. I'm actually learning about it because I'm, I'm reading a lot of those books right now. And of course, they do make me upset. But if I don't know my history, I don't know how to understand why a patient may not trust a physician. And so, um, or even even with this COVID stuff, you know, how we've had like racial disparity, disparities as it relates to that. And with the vaccine, I mean, when you, when you go back to like the syphilis stuff um, from several years back and how 
Um, they thought that they were getting penicillin shots and they weren't. They were getting syphilis and they were dying and things like that. Like, you know, the healthcare system is not trusted sometimes because of things of the history, but your job is to make sure that you act in a way and you carry yourself in a way where they trust you. So I think um, Farha had a question. She had her hand raised. So okay, please, please. I was just going to this next one. Hi, Dr. Sims. Thank you so Hi. much for addressing racial disparity in our field. Um, one of the follow-up questions that I had is, what advice do you have for pre-medical or aspiring physicians to um, keep going, even though envir the environment hasn't changed towards equitable uh, settings? So what advice do you have for us to keep going? You said because of um, for under equitable care for patients? Yes. So if we know like our colleagues are not really grasping that there is a need for change or it's not really encouraging to um, want to be a part of this system, how do you encourage us to like keep going? Change is taking a long time, right? So it is. It is. Um, I'm actually facing this right now. Um, we actually just developed our diversity, equity, and inclusion task force in our department. And um, that the, the diversity of the group is, is lacking a little bit. And we know that in our department, there are still some people that don't think that there are any issues. And what you do is you give the facts. You can't really do a lot of subjectiveness because people become offended and you lose out on making your point. You lose out on demonstrating the truth. So your goal is to like pull articles. Like for instance, I've done um, a couple journal clubs with the residents and the attendings come, even the ones that don't believe in it all. You pull the articles that actually show it. And so as a medical student, your goal is to participate in some things that, you know, like the um, American Medical Association, they are doing a lot on um, health equity. You participate in those types of activities. You do your advocacy work um, and you be a part of the change. So for instance, if your classmates aren't believing in it, you work with the people who do and you actually speak out when you see someone who is maybe not properly treating a person. So one of the examples that I gave on our, <clears throat> our um, session that I did the other night on Thursday night was um, people are treated differently based on the type of insurance they have. So if they have like Medicaid or if they have um, no insurance or if they're Spanish speaking, sometimes they'll be treated a little differently than the people that have like Blue Cross Blue Shield or Aetna or, you know, United Healthcare or whatever. And your goal as a medical student is to walk into the room with a blind over your eyes when it relates to the person's race, when it relates to the person's language, when it relates to the person's gender identity, to their um, insurance status, and you treat that person like a human being. You are one of the ones that are gonna be the generation who are training to do the right thing now. So that would be my advice. You create the change. You um, treat the proper uh, the patients properly, and if you see something, be the whistleblower. Like you know, that's really not right. You should, you know, I, or or you can say, well, for me, it doesn't matter. I don't really care about that. I just want to make sure that the patient is well taken care of. I don't care, you know, if she doesn't have this or that. Um, my goal is to make sure that she's well taken care of, or whatever the case is. So you just speak out when you have an opportunity and be the one that creates a great environment for the patient. Um, Dr. Sims, thank you so much for taking the time that was needed to answer that. I genuinely appreciate it and we need to create that environment. So thank you for inspiring us. Absolutely. Um, Why did I choose to get an MPH? Yeah, there were, a t throughout the whole chat, sorry, my lights just went out and so I'm like in the dark. Um, there were a ton of questions about your MPH, like why you got it, um, if you would recommend people get it, and how you've used it currently, if at all, in your practice, and how you anticipate that you can use it. 
For me, I, um, well, there's a couple reasons. One, I didn't get into medical school <laughs> and I had to find something to do. And so um, when I didn't get into medical school the second time, I actually um, applied to a post-baccalaureate program in um, Southern Illinois University, so in Carbondale, Illinois, and um, I didn't get in. So that was my third attempt to do something and I didn't get it. <laughs> and um, I said, well, I need this program and I need to be in you all's face. So I moved to Carbondale, Illinois, eight hours from home. I'm from Wichita, Kansas, just to get my master of public health. That's, so that's basically kind of what pushed me to get my master of public health. Cause I was like, I'm not gonna be out of school again for another year. So I went to get my MPH and as I was getting my MPH, I was taking upper level science courses and each semester I would go and meet with the med prep director to like let him know what I was doing, get more advice and things like that. So it kind of was like one of my like transition things that I did. However, I actually wanted some type of public health or public administration or like a healthcare administration degree anyway. So how do I use it? Every day, it helps me remember to consider the social determinants of health. My particular MPH is in community health education. So I did a lot of community organizing. I still do a lot of community organizing. Um, but the social determinants of health, I mean, I work at a federally qualified health center. So I have a lot of people that I take care of that have minimal resources. So just having that mindset that I was able to get during my public health years is what helps me take such great care of the patients that I take care of. Um, you know, gathering resources for them and making sure that I'm not treating a patient like a science figure, but as a whole person. Um, and so I, that's why um, I got it. And that's why I feel like it's important for me to have it. I mean, not everyone gets it. I know that some people get like an MD MPH and they can, you know, that's, that's a definite route to go. Some people get their MD first and then they go their MPH route later. But that's the reason why I actually went and got it first. Um, but it, it, it worked out really well for me because it just helped me become a more holistic physician. So there is someone else who has their hand raised. So if you also want to go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Oh, sorry. Look, can I just mention oh. this real quick? Oh, I just, I, I did mention how it informs my work. It just kind of helps me be a more holistic uh, physician. But I want to mention one other thing about the NPH. Because I had it, I actually uses that, I use that to get a raise on my job. Like I use that to like negotiate a higher pay. So they were like, well, we'll pay, this is how much they pay. And I was like, well, I got an MPH, so I need more. And I was able to negotiate more. So that's another thing that um, was really cool. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. You were saying what? Uh, yeah. So whoever, the person who has their hand raised, if you want to go ahead and unmute, you can. Sure, thanks. Sorry, I'm at the grocery store, so hopefully it doesn't sound weird or anything. I'm just like standing in the middle, so it's real awkward, but... Um, I think my your story really resonates because I recently just lost my insurance and I'm already on food stamps. And so I felt like I felt like a failure for wanting to take two gap years, which is sort of what I'm being forced into. So like when, t you know, like God tries us. <laughs> so what what kept you really going in those moments when it feels like it's not meant to be? What really kept you going every time that, you know, it seemed like something and something and something came up? You know, that is a great question. I mean, it was very, very hard. I mean, it. I speak about it now like it was like, oh, well, you know, I just kept on going. But like that, it does get to the point where you actually have an emotional low because you're like, where do I go next? What pushed me is the fact that I knew what I was supposed to do. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that I was supposed to be a physician. I knew that that's what the Lord wanted me to do. I just had to figure out how to do it. And I had to get myself to a point where I was like, well, let me stop trying to do this on my own. I got to go get some help. And that's why, of course, I went to med prep. But um, the things that you want to remember are your initial passion for your field or your initial passion for um, wanting to just be a physician in general. Those are the things when you get to your low that help you propel forward. Um, and just remembering this current situation is not predictive. 
of my success or my future. And what I have come to see is that the people that struggle the most are the people that appreciate the most. I remember some of my classmates were like, why do you have love life on your tags? Or why do you do, why do you have so many people coming to your graduation? Or why, you know, just things like that. And I was like, well, it took me a lot to get here. And I actually appreciate the fact that the Lord has allowed me to make this point. And so I realized that a lot of my classmates that just went from boom, 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 boom. It was like, well, shoot, this is, this is what I'm supposed to get. For me, it was like, no, this is what I worked for. Like, of course, everybody works hard. Like they all work as hard, but you have a little bit of a more sense of pride when it comes from, you've come from a rock bottom struggle um, to get to the same level as someone else. And so um, what keeps you going is you just remember those, those um, that, it's, that it's not gonna be like that always. And you remember your initial passion and that initial passion should fuel you always. Thank you so much. Yes, Dr. Sims, thank you so much for answering all these questions. Um, do we, do you want to go ahead and do, I don't know if you said a tour or? Yes. Said, okay. Yes. Let me. So whenever we want to do that, we can. I am going to go in on my computer right now. And okay, so we're you into the I'm going to. Okay, so Dr. Sims is going to join on her phone. Um, and I'm sorry, y'all, I can't see the questions that were still there. Um, but please feel free to message me. I respond to all of them. Every single one I'll respond to. Um, all right, one second. Let me just get my mask on. Um, somebody asked the question, if there's a person with a disability, do we do, what do we do to help them? So when it's time to take your board exams, there are ways where you can sign up for like extra time. Um, you'll just go through that process. And of course, if we needed to, we can actually help patients, I mean, patients, help the residents, um, you know, sign up for that. And then if you, um, you know, it's like you're in a wheelchair or if you, you know, have an arm brace or, you know, just something like that. Um, yes, we, we're not going to discriminate and we'll find our, we'll find the best mechanism for you to be able to train the way that you need to train. And y'all can actually reach out. Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> Is somebody in here in the lounge? Uh -oh. Nobody? Okay. Okay. Well, let me just, I'm going to show you all. The resident lounge. Let me turn it around. So this is the resident lounge. This is where they hang out at when they're on call. So they have a TV up there and there's a chair here in the middle. And this is the board. So yes, we can see what's going on with the patients while they are um, seeing patients. Um, I think the resident is um, seeing a patient in women's urgent care. Hey, hi y'all, hey. All right, y'all, let's go. Oh, I'll show y'all go. Let me put on a... I'll try to put on a hat real quick so I can show y'all what the OR looks like. Great. We about to roll on that C-section at some point. Have you heard? Are we rolling on that C-section at some point? Have you heard? Oh, is it, you bring that for the C-section? Let's do it. Everyone loves this um, visual, so thank you so for showing us around. This is awesome. Okay. Yeah. 
So we have five ORs back here. Two of them are like specifically for OB and then three are specifically for GYE because this is a women's hospital. So, um, and this is the OR that I operate in the most when I'm here. And we actually have one that's designated for uh, a COVID C-section. So if the person has COVID, we'll only do her C-section in this room. So it's all way to set up and you can see we have the incubators and stuff in here. We actually just leave that room available. This room actually has, oh, that's probably them calling me for the, to come see some patients, women doesn't care. This has a robot. And as you can see, we have the surgeon's console and this is the teaching console. So um, we can actually teach our residents to do robotic procedures in this room. And, Let's go down to the whoop, as we say, with his urgent care. Yeah, this is them calling. It's perfect timing, y'all. We're able to get through that. Praise the Lord. I like to use the stairs because I get my It's just two, two lights. I think the connection's a little bad in the stairwell, so. Okay, I'm out of the stairwell. Is there it better go. now? Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yes, that's the Da Vinci. Oh, and this right here. Hey, y'all. <laughs> Y'all only changed me one. Y'all like y'all been changing me all day. No, we haven't been changing you. I just I don't want to. And ain't nobody told me what y'all supposed to be eating for the uh, for dinner either. I didn't, I didn't. What? Pick what? I don't how much am I supposed to be paying? These are some of our rooms. Oh, sorry, this sorry, y'all, there's a patient in there. We got a big thing up there. These are some of the residents. Say hi, y'all. They're student shadowing. This is this is hi. resident life, um, obstetrics and gynecology resident life. Hey, do y'all want? Yeah, do y'all want to um, give a piece of advice? Um, what's your best piece of advice for someone that is going into OBGYN residency, or like trying to go into OBGYN residency? Okay, um, remember out. that you <laughs> remember that you are a person outside of your abilities. Oh. That's, That's a good one, y'all. That is real good. <laughs> yeah, just so, you so, so yeah. So, I'll tell them what year you are. I'm a third year. So she's a third year. So you, I'm gonna let y'all see the difference in these um, discussions. Okay. So this is this is Dr. Roca. Okay. So what is your piece of advice? Sleep now. Have fun. Um, and believe in yourself. So the difference is, she says sleep now because she's not getting any sleep. She's an intern. <laughs> So she gets up really early to come around and all that good stuff. Okay, so what y'all got? What's up? Let me close this door. So yeah, um, room two is gonna go upstairs. She had a uh, 18 year old G1, 37 and six. She ruptured this morning mm -hmm. at 6 a.m. Clear. She oh, that's the five like, centimeter look. one. Yeah, she's 590 minus one. Baby's a little small actually. On my weight, it's 25, and then I got pissed because I didn't realize she had just seen the me, but my weight was well, 60 <laughs> grams off. <laughs> well, look at you, go, girl. Okay, so um, what was her uh, so percentage? Ninety. She's super thin, but I don't know if it's because no, no, her like her. You said the baby was small. Oh yeah, it's it's not IGR. Okay. Um, or, so she's only thirty seven. So yeah, you know she's, she's gonna be a little bit smaller. Than. Yeah. Um, she's sixteen. Okay, cool. She's, All right. Um, but like, I'm hoping she still has a palpable bag, but her until positive, and she has a great story. Um, it's so, all good. Yeah, she's just, I think she's just laboring anyway. I think she would I'm do reading anyway. you last questions as she's talking to me. This is a blessing. Thank you. You're so welcome. Um, and then this girl, I want to admit, <laughs> um, she's, I think, got Paolo by exam, um, 25 year old. She's a G4, P2, I think, one, 1021. Um, She's how far along? Six and something, Roka? Yeah, I got six and uh, I got my clipboard here. Prior section, 
had gonorrhea and chlamydia, bipolar. She's GBS bacteria based on this admission that last time she was seen. Um, and then HSV, history of postpartum depression. She came in because she had a fever at home with 101. She's oh, been a fever out here, but she took Tylenol. Mm -hmm. yeah. But she, her specific complaint is flank pain, like on this left side. Mm -hmm. um, dysuria and she's got significant cva tenderness she's had mm -hmm. nausea and vomiting today her urine is like stone cold normal but i don't trust it because yeah, she's got super pubic but is that a uh your analysis or is it dip it's a dip so yeah, you can do an analysis. rua but i was just gonna keep I, her and do the pilot stuff anyway started, so it sounds I good. my fingers to um like fill her bladder and she about came i've never had anyone run away from me that fast okay she's well, got it y'all she got it so okay. she's just gonna get the routine pilot stuff yeah. she didn't have any respiratory complaints um this girl i can go home but roca can tell you about her mm -hmm. is that henderson yes yeah. henderson. okay what's up she's complicated but she's, well she's tell me the high points um, she's here for a baby now her. she's six and one she okay. came in with constipation so her first words where I want an enema. So gave her an enema, she had a bowel movement. Um, so she's feeling better from that standpoint. Then she started complaining of um, like a epigastric kind of like pain. Um, she was recently admitted for uh, pancreatitis, um, I want to say two weeks ago to medicine. Um, and so we went ahead and did labs on her. Amylase and lipase are at the normal limits. All of her labs are normal actually, except for her glucose. She's a type one diabetic, I, didn't, I left that out, I'm sorry. Um, type one. So her first finger stick was 234. She did not take her um, lunchtime um, insulin. So I went ahead. So she's followed by who? She has her first appointment with Dr. We put her in high risk. High okay. Risk. Yes. So I think it's Owens on Monday. Okay. But she's Monday. already on like a um a regimen, like a us regimen yes. or what? She's on so they consulted us. Her okay, okay, admission. gotcha. She's on Whisper 666, Love Amir. And then but she was like an early IP then yes. and now you're dated her. Yes. So okay. I just dated her today. Um, so today we are we're 234. I gave her four units side and scale, and then she Lispro or later, regular? Um, I did Lispro. Okay. Um, they don't have regular down here. Apparently. Okay. Um, and then it was an hour. No, I prefer regular. I mean, it Lispro anyway. Um, so yeah, that's okay. cool. Two nineteen. So I gave her another four, and now she's one thirty one. Mm -hmm. Um, she is like a different person. We gave her Percocet. Her pain is better. Mm -hmm. Um, she's up walking around, um, ready to go home. Okay, to the house. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, she's a different person because she she had a bowel move, right? She is. Okay, then, girl. What you gonna put her on? <laughs> Dude, right, oh lord okay well what y'all gonna put her on actually right she's already on right. daily Miralax. i gave her reglan here it made her feel better so i was gonna send her home on reglan and then um trying to think what else i can do besides Miralax daily i guess going crazy add some collates yeah, from, add she can do uh Miralax vid too if she needs yeah. to okay mm -hmm. sounds great okay sounds good about the other girl oh more yeah let me pull uh Miralax. she just so that she we had a lady come in. Um, the nurses were like, "Oh, she's about to have a baby," so we like get her in there and yank her pants down and get her out of bed. Um, she's fingertip. Turns out she's only three months pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, fingertip. She's like her external os is maybe fingertip. Okay, well she's clay. She's not even close. She's close. We spoke to several medical school admissions Excuse committees, me. and they said that birth. Um, I probably search on so I don't know if you definitely right still put on your applications. It shows initiative and it's adversity to be taking good point. Okay, that's actually oh, that's from from the socially distant shadowers. That's awesome, y'all. Um, that you're able to do that. How long do I spend charting and writing notes? Oh Lord, what she said all the time. It's a lot more than I ever thought. Tell me the high points, <laughs> the worst to live by. <laughs> That is so true. She's like, she's complicated. I said, well, I don't want to know all that. What's she here for and why she leaving? Okay. Um. This girl. Oh, that's good. I love how inclusive this is. I feel like I'm a part of the conversation, even though I have a little knowledge on what's going on. Ha ha, that's great. Okay. Do y'all have any final um, questions? Can I speak about my foundation? Yes, it's called Sims Foundation of Hope, and that's what they are on um, Instagram and Facebook. And um, I actually started that as a resident, and um, and it was I mainly started the foundation because I needed something to run my conference out of. I do a conference called um, Imagine You. It's for middle and high school girls, and it's aimed at promoting health and wellness, career and personal development, positive self images. Um, 
I've been doing it for five years. I actually did the first one as a fourth year medical student. And um, it's actually a really, really nice time to a lot of people. Um, and uh, we've served, it's, it's actually free. We've served probably over 400 young ladies at this point. And um, recommendations post COVID and scoring um, shadow, shadowing opportunities. I would say do the, what I said pre COVID, do those same things. I can actually send out my slides so that y'all can see them. Um, is your conference local, national now? Um, so the conference is um, in Dallas and in Jackson, Mississippi. And um, we did not do our sixth year, which would have been like last year, right in the middle of COVID. So the 2019 conference, we actually did not do um, the 20, no, sorry, the 2020 conference. We didn't do 2021 is actually going to be virtual and it's on June 5th. Um, I actually haven't even started advertising it for it now because I'm in the process of opening up a, uh, an apparel store for our foundation. <laughs> and I've just kind of gotten a little bit behind, but that is actually going to be the date. Um, I see y'all, I see some of y'all hopping on the website right now. Um, was considering changing my major to public health from biochemistry. Any advice for becoming a non-science pre-med major? Honestly, major in whatever you want. I will tell you that if I could do it all over again, I probably would have majored in something like physiology. But a lot of programs um, don't actually have physiology. The reason why I say that is because most of your year one and a lot of your year two, which I'll say too for medical school, is physiology. So if you have that great foundation, like you all are gonna be the bomb.com on your MCAT and you're gonna be the bomb.com on every um, everything that you do in your initial, um, you know, introductions to medical school. Do you mentor students and how should we reach out if we are interested? Oh, just reach out <laughs> on something. Um, I have people that reach out to me and they'd be like, oh, by the way, you're my mentor now. And I'm like, okay, fine. <laughs> I'll go ahead and put your Instagram in the chat again for those that are interested. Well, yeah, you're busy. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Couldn't help but overhearing regarding the laxative prescriptions. Were there any contra um, contraindications for suppositories in your patients? Um, the people that we do not do laxative for are the people that had bowel work done. Um, but otherwise, if it's a pregnant lady, go ahead and get your suppository because the hormones of pregnancy actually constipate you um, more than you already are if you already have like constipation. So um, yeah, we don't mind people using that stuff because we want you to be comfy and we don't want you to come to women's urgent care for constipation either. She didn't try home stuff. Did you have difficulty explaining in your application to MD schools why I get an MPH degree? No, they loved it. They didn't care. They were like, oh, and she already has an MPH. That was actually a benefit that they saw. So, nope. Um, someone asked earlier about the books about race and medicine. What is a really good one? Um, so the ones that I, the one that I just finished, um, there's one called a medical, uh, medical apartheid. I'm actually reading that currently. And the one that I just finished is called Medical Bondage by Deidre Cooper Owens. The Medical Apartheid is by Harriet A. Washington. I just actually purchased them and download them on like the um, audiobooks. But those are really good ones um, that you can kind of learn from. Oh, it's up to you all. Will I come back? Always. No problem. <laughs> coming we back. Want... This is my second one. <laughs> I'm so fine with coming back. I'll just find another call shift and come on and, and, and let y'all know. Yes. Take anatomy and theology. Absolutely. How did your MPH and um, reapplications make you stand out more as a med, med school applicant? I have similar background. Um. I mean, I think they just like that. So some people, I what was considered a non-traditional student and some um, programs really like diversity. And so sometimes they would like to see some non-traditional students because they're just a little bit more um, uh, mature. 
Um, but they also like the fact that you have a background that you can actually use in your, um, you know, in your training. Um, and so. Is what's your face feeling better? I feel like that's how I stood out because I was just a little older and all of that. The death gap, how it equally kills. Oh, that's a good one. Somebody messaged that to me on Instagram. Kevin, uh, Dr. Thomas, Thomas, send that to me on Instagram, please, or, you know, on one of my places. Pro-life? Yes, you can pursue OBGYN when you're pro-life. You don't have to do abortions. My hospital cannot do abortions. Um, as a matter of fact, um, if you do an abortion, you're not going to get paid for it, and you might you might go to jail or something here in Mississippi uh, and, and in um, places where you, they're not allowed. But I will tell you this, I have done an abortion under a couple of circumstances. One I did because the mom had breast cancer and she needed, she was only six weeks pregnant. She was on birth control and she, it was like a birth control fail. And then she had just found out that she had breast cancer and she needed chemotherapy. So I will do them under those type of circumstances, but I'm not going to do your, uh, your uh, uh, abortion because that's your birth control. You need to get your, get a Mirena get you a um get you an excellent on get you a depot shot or whatever but um i will do one under those type of circumstances i had to do one on one of my own patients because she had preeclampsia at 16 weeks that's typically very very unheard of she was a very very sick person and to save her life i did do an abortion for her so if it comes to those type of circumstances at our hospital we actually have to go to our legal department and through our ethics department and they have to approve it first, and then we can perform those procedures. The battery is low. No, I haven't read the uh, new book, Consent. I would love to read that. Yes, DOs. We actually have some DOs in our OBGYN program right now. Yes, I will come back. Yes. Oh, yep. DOs. What are some recommendation uh, recommended experiences one should have if they're interested in OBGYN? You know what? Honestly, just um, get as much as like your goal is to just get as much experience as you can to getting into medical school. Going from medical school into um, OBGYN residency, my recommendation would be to become a member of the OBGYN interest group and do as many activities as you can. You also want to demonstrate that you are a good leader. So you want to try to go for some of the leadership positions like the social chair or the <laughs> or the um, outreach chair or the president, vice president, do those types of things so that, you know, you can demonstrate that you're a part of the group, you've shown your interest and you become a leader and you've done all the activities of the group. Um, if you want to do some research, do some research, do some shadowing of OBGYNs, um, try to, you know, show the um, OBGYN department at your current medical school that you're working on your surgical skills and things. You wanna go to your surgical skills labs because as an OBGYN, you are a surgeon and you do not wanna go into um, your residency for the first year without knowing anything about surgery or not knowing how to you know, suture and things like that. So those would be my recommendations going into OB um, residency. Thank you so much, Dr. Sims. Um, I think that's it for questions. And then we yeah. put your Instagram I'm in there. so happy that y'all were able to get a little bit more of your questions answered. Feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or wherever, yeah, um, we, Facebook. We, we, I will see you all next time. For sure. We put your Instagram in the chat and then people know where to find you. If you guys have any questions for Dr. Sims, definitely check her out there. You're welcome. You're welcome. Us, and we'll <laughs> talk very soon. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Have a good one, y'all.